Welcome to Fantasy Cartography, the show where we see what maps can teach us about fantasy and what fantasy can teach us about maps. Today, we're going to look at the mystery of those numbers and bars at the bottom of maps, we'll find out what the speed of fantasy is, and I'll get very upset about the Imperial system and tell you how I cheated through every single mapping exercise in my bachelor's degree. Some quick news for everyone, I'm going to be on a podcast called Insert Quest Here. IQH is an actual play podcast which delivers unedited sessions of high-quality, story-heavy tabletop role-playing games. We'll be playing a game called The Deep Forest, a mapping-based post-colonial RPG, so you'll be able to hear me and some other nerds work out a fantasy map and make up some really weird monsters to live there. I can't tell you exactly when the podcast will come out because we're not even recording until after the day this video releases, but you can follow my social media and check out the IQH website in the description if you want to be updated when the podcast arrives. Now, on to the topic of the day. It's a pretty well-known cartographic fact that you can't make a map which is the same size as the thing you're mapping. Even if you wanted to make a life-size map of an average room, the folding process would be difficult to say the least. That's why we have the concept of scale. You're probably familiar with the general idea of a scale diagram or scale model. You make a small version of a thing, so it has the same proportions as the big version, but fits in a smaller space, so you don't need to unfold it all the way out to actual size. For example, if you're making a diagram or a model of a building, you might use a 1 to 10 scale, where one unit of measure on the diagram is equal to 10 units of measure on the real thing. This is called a scale ratio, one of the three main ways you can express the scale of a map. Scale ratios are versatile and simple, and they can be used in a lot more things than maps. For example, if you're making a diagram of something really small, like a microchip or a virus, you want to make it bigger than actual size, so you could write a 10 to 1 or 1000 to 1 scale. Just remember that when you're writing a scale ratio, the first number is for the diagram and the second number is for the real thing, and at least one of the numbers should be a 1. Scale ratios do run into problems as the numbers get bigger. While it's very easy to understand a 1 to 10 scale in your head, what are you going to do when you see a scale like 1 to 100 million? The usual thing to do is to convert downwards by crossing off factors of 10. If 1 centimetre on the map equals 100 million centimetres, that means it's 1 million metres or 1,000 kilometres. In my opinion, only a very cruel cartographer would actually write out a scale like this. The nice thing to do is to create what's called a lexical scale, using words and units to create a ratio, like we just did with that cancellation. Now, some cartographic purists hate lexical scales. They think that it's cheating, only the purity of numbers should be used to express scale. In my opinion, those purists are completely wrong. Maps are made to be read, and if you can't understand the scale, you can't read the map properly. If a lexical scale is clearer than a ratio scale, you should use the lexical scale. That becomes especially important when you're dealing with imperial units. I mean, when we cancelled out our 1 to 100 million scale, at least the maths was easy. What are you going to do with a scale of 1 to 7920, or 1 to 72960? Those are much easier to pass if you express them lexically, as 1 inch to 1 furlong, or 1 inch to 1 nautical mile, respectively. Although I'll never understand why so many fantasy authors insist upon the useless bloody imperial system. You know how to invent metric units? Dwarves. Dwarves wouldn't put up with this elven nonsense of chains and furlongs and leagues. Dwarves would invent something sensible. The last type of scale is probably the one that you've seen the most often. A scale bar. Scale bars are different from ratios and lexical scales because they're a visual representation rather than a numeric one. They do have one pretty strong advantage over ratios and lexical scales, in that you can actually change the size of the map. See, if we draw a map with a 1cm to 1km scale, and then we make that map twice as large, the map has gotten larger while the real landscape presumably hasn't. So we have to change the scale. With a doubling in size, the scale becomes 2cm to 1km, or 1cm to 500m. Scale bars don't have that problem. If you have a map with a scale bar on it and you make the map twice as big, then the scale bar would get twice as big as well. 
That makes them really convenient if you're making a map which is going to be published in various formats, which is of course a serious concern for fantasy authors. If your hardback, paperback and ebook all have slightly different page sizes, the scale bar will still be of appropriate size in every edition. The problem with a scale bar is that it's not actually as easy to use as a ratio or a lexical scale. In order to use a scale bar properly, you need a tool, like a ruler or a pair of dividers. If you're using a marked ruler on a map which has been rescaled, it might be a bit inconvenient. For example, if you draw a scale bar of 1cm to 1km, and then the map is scaled down to 87.5% of its original size for publication, a person using a marked ruler will have to measure out 8.75mm for every kilometre on the map. Lexical scales are usually more versatile, but scale bars are your best bet if you can't be certain of your map keeping a consistent size. There are a couple of extra issues with scales that I should mention before we move on. In traditional cartography, the terminology of large scale and small scale are, to use a technical term, completely arse backwards. A large scale map covers a small area with a small number in the scale ratio while a small scale map covers a large area and has a large number in the scale ratio. If you listen to those boring cartographic purists I spoke about earlier, they'll tell you that this is because scale ratios are technically a type of fraction, and the fraction of a large scale map is smaller than the fraction of a small scale map, but this terminology is so messed up that unless you're talking to an audience full of cartographers, I'd recommend avoiding using these words altogether when you're talking about a map. The other problem, which affects every type of scale and is caused by universal mathematics instead of a stupid use of the English language, ties back to the concept of map projection. I covered this more extensively in episode 8, but if you want the short version, Earth is a spheroid so you can't flatten it down onto a perfectly flat piece of paper, so when you're making a flat paper map of the Earth you need to map the continents onto a different shape like a cylinder or a cone. But that means that any flat paper map which covers the entire world or a significant proportion of its surface will have a distorted scale. When you look at a professionally made world map, it will have a stack of multiple scale bars that looks something like this, because the scale of the map will change with latitude. This isn't usually something that you have to worry about for a fantasy map though, because only horrible pedants like me will complain about it. A lot of the most popular fantasy novels in the world are heavily based on the idea of travel, whether that's one big journey like The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, or a succession of smaller journeys like the movements of characters and armies in A Song of Ice and Fire. This goes way back beyond the advent of modern fantasy, of course. The idea of a hero's mystical journey through fantastic lands is the oldest story structure in the world, as Joseph Campbell will tell you. But the difference between the classic myths Campbell spoke about and modern fantasy interpretations of the same idea is that we usually expect modern stories to take place in a real space. I don't mean that we expect every fantasy novel to be set on the real Earth. I mean that we expect them to follow consistent rules of space-time. Campbellian myths work off dream logic where everything is as far from everything else as it needs to be. Modern fantasy stories are expected to be more realistic with their use of space, especially if they have a map in the frontispiece. Now of course, not every modern fantasy author is bound to real space-time. Neil Gaiman, for example, is fantastic at writing distorted fairy tale spaces. But if your book does use a map to establish itself as a real place, it's going to face real expectations of scale. A lot of fantasy maps don't feature a scale at all. This is tremendously annoying to me as a cartographer because adding a scale is a really important part of making an accurate map. Not every map needs to have a scale. If you're making a diagrammatic map like the map of a public transport system, it's more important for the map to be readable. But if you're trying to make a general purpose map of the Earth's surface or any other planet's surface, you really ought to use a scale. The main way that scale impacts fantasy storytelling is in the problems of travel time. In a fantasy story, we would generally presume that any trip from A to B is going to be done on foot or on horseback. That means they aren't fast. This is why those journey-based stories work in fantasy settings. The out-of-universe reason that Frodo didn't just ride the eagles to Mordor is because that wouldn't have made for a good story. What that means for fantasy authors is that dropping the scale from your map lets you fudge the numbers. Let's look at the Wheel of Times maps. Robert Jordan said in interviews that he always thought the Westlands, the subcontinent where most of the events of the series take place, is about the size of two American states, because otherwise it would take too long to get anywhere. 
but the measurements that actually appear in the books and the companions makes the continent seem a lot bigger than that. In New Spring, the difference between Tarvalon and the city of Tyr is said to be 400 leagues as the crow flies, and the reference book The World of Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time says that one league is equal to four miles. Chris Lau used these numbers and figured out that the Westlands were 3,480 miles across. This number is also fairly consistent with the scale on the world map, also from The World of Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. But that makes it substantially wider than the entire contiguous United States, quite a lot bigger than the couple of states across travel times that Jordan actually wrote. But at least Jordan's writing is fairly consistent, even if his use of scales isn't. If you aren't consistent with your uses of scales, people notice. This is one criticism of the Game of Thrones TV show which has actually hit the popular consciousness. This map shows how far the White Walkers and Jon Snow travelled between Season 5 Episode 8 and Season 7 Episode 5. Sure, Jon has access to boats and horses while the White Walkers are on foot, but the White Walkers also don't need to eat or sleep. Those are some really, really slow zombies. Since the main way that scale affects fantasy stories is in travel time, if you're making a fantasy map, the best way to make a scale is to start from the travel times and work backwards. If you want two towns to be three days apart on horseback, figure out how far a horse rider can go in one day, multiply that by three, and set your scale from there. Mind you, actually finding reliable figures for how far people could travel in a day using pre-industrial methods can be difficult. There are a lot more factors which can slow or interrupt travel when you don't have asphalt highways, internal combustion engines and jet planes. Travelling by foot is dependent on the health and fitness of the people walking, how much gear they're carrying, what kind of terrain they're crossing and what the weather is like. On horseback you have to consider all those things as well as the breed and training of the horse and how good a rider the person is. And when you're travelling by boat, don't get me started on the things that can ruin a good boat trip. But once you've found a scale, how do you keep it consistent? Well if you're hand drawing a map, you're going to need one of these wondrous devices. This is an architect's scale ruler. It has four separate marked edges, each one of which has two scale ratios on it. The ratios it uses are on the small side for map making, they range from a 1 to 1 up to a 1 to 500, but thanks to the metric system it's pretty easy to convert those in your head. If I'm working with a 1 to 50,000 scale, I would just use the 1 to 50 scale and replace the metres with kilometres. Sure, it might not work out for people who are writing in imperial units, but quite frankly, anyone working with imperial units should just put some dwarves in their novel so they could invent the metric system and stop confusing the 98% of the world who uses metric. <laughs> That's it for this episode of Fantasy Cartography, but please stay until after the credits for the unrelated interesting fact of the day. If you want to support the show, then please buy me a coffee on ko-fi.com slash fantasycartography, or you can follow my pages on Tumblr, Facebook and Twitter, and ask me anything using the Tumblr Ask box. Don't forget to check out Insert Quest here for updates on my special guest podcast appearance. And of course, you can send me an email at fantasycartography at iinet.net.au. Until next time, may your fantasy be cartographic and your cartography be fantastical. One thing you could use to calibrate the scale on a fantasy map is the Pony Express, a postal service which ran from St. Joseph in Missouri to Sacramento in California, a total length of about 3,100 kilometres. Riders would change horses every 16 kilometres and the mail would be passed between riders every 120 to 160 kilometres. With this efficient rotation keeping the riders and horses fresh 24 hours a day, the entire route could be completed in about 10 days, at an average speed of about 13 kilometres per hour. The Pony Express has become a major part of America's Old West legends, but it never turned a profit and only lasted for 19 months before the Transcontinental Telegraph put it out of business. Bye! 87.5? No, 8.75. Duh. Maths.